The death of Elaine Herzberg on March the 18th, 2018, marked a historic milestone as the first recorded pedestrian fatality involving a self-driving car. The incident occurred late in the evening in Arizona when Herzberg, pushing a bicycle across a four-lane road, was struck by an Uber test vehicle operating in self-drive mode. A human safety backup driver was present in the driving seat. Transported to a local hospital, Herzberg died, prompting a thorough investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB. In response to the findings, the NTSB issued critical recommendations and censored Uber. Consequently, Uber suspended self-driving vehicle testing in Arizona where it had been permitted since August 2016. The company also opted not to renew its California testing permit, which expired at the end of March 2018. Uber eventually resumed testing in December 2018. In March 2019, Arizona prosecutors absolved Uber of criminal responsibility for the crash while the backup driver faced charges of negligent homicide. Herzberg's death was the first recorded incident of a pedestrian fatality caused by a self-driving car. On April the 10th, 2018, a 16-year-old Kyle Plush lost his life due to asphyxiation inside a Honda Odyssey. The incident took place in the parking lot of his school in Cincinnati, Ohio, marking a devastating chapter in his young life. What started as a simple task of retrieving his tennis equipment quickly turned into a harrowing ordeal. Unknown to Kyle, leaning over the third row of seats towards the trunk would prove to be a fatal decision. The seats compressed, trapping him and leading to his asphyxiation. In an attempt to seek help, Kyle dialed 911 twice, using his smartphone's voice assistant to relay his distress. Unfortunately, his calls went unanswered and the responding police faced challenges in locating him in the vastness of the school's parking lot. As time passed, each moment amplified the anguish felt by those waiting for news. After six agonizing hours, it was Carl's father who made the heartbreaking discovery, finding his lifeless son within the confines of the vehicle. In the bustling city of Taegu, South Korea, a story unfolded that sent shockwaves through the gaming community and beyond. It all began with a 28-year-old man, known only by his family name, Lee. He was an avid gamer drawn to the virtual worlds of online computer games, but his passion would soon lead him down a tragic path. Lee's tale began on a summer's day, August the 3rd, when he embarked on an extraordinary gaming journey. He entered an internet cafe, a haven for gamers seeking uninterrupted hours of play, and there he sat down to play the popular game StarCraft. Little did he know that this gaming session would extend for a staggering 50 consecutive hours. As he immersed himself in the captivating digital universe of StarCraft, Lee paid little attention to the needs of his physical body. He had barely slept and had hardly eaten throughout this gaming marathon. The cafe became his world, the pixels on the screen his reality. South Korea, a nation with a lightning fast and widespread broadband connection, was no stranger to the allure of online multiplayer gaming. In this country, gaming has transcended mere entertainment. It had become a way of life. Professional gamers were not only rewarded with substantial sponsorships, but some were even taking in more than 100,000 a year. Lee, like many others, was ensnared by the virtual realm, unable to resist the call of the game. The hours turned into days and Lee's health deteriorated. He paused briefly for nature's call and grabbed a few minutes of fitful sleep, but he couldn't tear himself away from the game for long. It was during one of these sleep-deprived moments that disaster struck. Lee collapsed, his body was weakened by fatigue and malnutritionment. News of this tragic incident quickly spread, capturing the attention of South Korean authorities. It was in their grim duty to inform the world that Lee's cause of death was likely heart failure as a result of extreme exhaustion. 
He was rushed to the hospital, but it was too late. Lee's life was extinguished, leaving behind a void that couldn't be filled. This heartbreaking incident underscored the darker side of the gaming world, where passion could turn into obsession and ultimately tragedy. Lee's family revealed that he had recently lost his job because of his persistent gaming. Online computer games were experiencing a meteoric rise in popularity and stories of individuals spending from 10 to 15 hours a day in virtual worlds were becoming all too common. Experts cautioned players to take regular screen breaks and the allure of these immersive experiences often proved irresistible. South Korea, with over 15 million registered online gamers, equivalent to 30% of the population, was a testament to the power of the gaming world. In this nation, gaming was more than just a pastime, it was a culture, an industry, and in some cases, a perilous obsession. A tragic and bizarre incident unfolded in a quiet corner of San Jose del Balque, eastern Argentina, where the lifeless body of a 58-year-old shepherd named Jose Alberto was discovered in his home. The circumstances were deeply unsettling as neighbours had reported an unusual and putrid odour emanating from the residence. Concerned by the stench, the police were compelled to investigate. What they encountered within those walls left them dumbfounded. As they entered the dwelling, they found Mr Alberto's lifeless form. Beside him lay a scarecrow, inexplicably transformed into a peculiar resemblance of a woman. The scarecrow had been adorned with a long-haired wig, lipstick and an affixed strap-on device. Rodolfo Moore, the spokesperson for the prosecutor's office, recounted the perplexing scene, stating, I initially thought that there were two bodies, but then I realised one was a scarecrow wearing lipstick and a long-haired wig. It was lying next to the deceased and had a six-inch appendage. Intriguingly, no signs of violence were evident, leaving the investigators to grapple with a perplexing mystery. They are currently operating under the assumption that Mr Alberta may have met an unfortunate demise during an intimate encounter with the dressed scarecrow. In the vibrant city of Dusseldorf, Germany, where the spirit of athletics and competition filled the air, a spine-chilling incident unfolded. It was a day marked by both promise and tragedy. The backdrop was an athletics event, a testament to human strength and endurance, where the athletes and officials came together to celebrate the beauty of physical achievement. Among them, a 74-year-old official named Dieter Strack, whose dedication and experience had earned him the respect and admiration of all who knew him. One fateful Sunday, the sun cast a warm glow over the stadium. Dieter Strack, was carrying out his duties as an official, overseeing the throws of javelin, a discipline that demanded precision and technique. As he ventured forward to measure a throw, little did he know that destiny had something cruel in store. A javelin hurled with force and determination by a 15-year-old competitor was on its trajectory towards the ground. It was a moment when time seemed to slow, as the pointed end of the javelin found an unintended target the throat of Mr Strack. The stadium, once filled with chairs and applause, fell into a sudden silence as the reality of the situation unfurled. The immediate response was swift as Mr Strack was rushed to the hospital, hope and prayers accompanying him on his journey. However, the injuries he sustained in that heart-wrenching instant proved unsurmountable. The world of athletics had lost one of its own. The competition, once filled with dreams and victory, was abruptly called off. It wasn't just Mr Strack who was affected. The 15-year-old competitor, whose javelin found an unintended target, was left traumatised by the incident. Psychological counselling was offered to him as authorities grappled with the aftermath. The local athletics association released a statement identifying the fallen official as Mr Strack. Their words echoed the sentiments of all who had the privilege of knowing him. He was a much-loved and experienced sports judge, a man who had dedicated himself to the pursuit of fairness and excellence in the world of athletics. All of us who were there and horrified in shock, we will always remember Dieter Strack. The statement concluded, a tribute to the life lost in the service of sport. On the fateful day of October the 26th, 2020, Christopher Bollock, a seasoned police chief in San Jose, Philippines, 
encountered a tragic and unusual turn of events while immersed in the day-to-day -day responsibilities of law enforcement. Christopher was diligently working on a case involving illegal gambling during an anti-gambling raid. The suspect in question were entangled in the old age and illicit activity of cockfighting. Cockfighting, a brutal blood sport, involved putting two roosters or gamecocks against each other in a confined arena. These birds are equipped with sharp blades, intensifying the ferocity of the battle and often leading to severe injuries, incapacitation or death. The twisted allure of cockfighting draws participants seeking entertainment and engaging in gambling activities. In the midst of carrying out his duties to break up the cockfighting match, Disaster struck for Christopher Bollock. A rooster armed with a blade attached to its leg for combat lashed out at him. The blade slashed through Christopher's leg, severing his femoral artery and unleashing a torrent of blood. Sadly, this grievous injury proved fatal, leading to Christopher bleeding to death in the line of duty. In a sad turn of events, a man named Darren Hickey met his untimely demise after an unfortunate encounter with an exceptionally hot fish cake. The incident unfolded when the 51-year-old wedding planner was offered a fish cake to sample by a chef at a wedding venue on April the 4th. Little did Mr Hickey know that the seemingly innocuous culinary experience would take a fatal turn. The intensity of the fish cake's heat left his throat scorched, initiating a chain of events that would ultimately lead to his demise. Over the course of the next 12 hours, Mr Hickey's voice box began to swell, gradually escalating to a point where it impeded his ability to breathe. Faced with worsening pain, Mr Hickey sought medical attention at the urgent care of Shirley Hospital in Lancashire. Inquest revealed a disconcerting aspect of the case, casting a spotlight on the care provided by the hospital. Despite the severity of his condition, Mr Hickey was reportedly sent home with paracetamol, a decision that the coroner deemed questionable. As the pain persisted, the impediment to Mr Hickey's breathing and swallowing became increasingly severe due to the swelling. A pathologist who conducted a post-mortem examination noted the rarity of such a case, typically only observed in individuals who have experienced smoke inhalation during house fires, resulting in airway burns. He elaborated on the unusual nature of the situation. Patients in such cases can suddenly experience swelling, leading to respiratory distress. The sad incident raises not only questions about the circumstances surrounding Mr Hickey's passing, but also the concerns about the adequacy of medical care provided. The vibrant life of Margaret Moura, a 21-year-old senior at Tulane University, was abruptly cut short at a Mississippi Highway rest stop on a fateful Tuesday afternoon. Margaret, affectionately known as Meg, had embarked on a spring break trip with friends, creating memories that will soon be overshadowed by an unimaginable accident. The group had paused at a rest area of Interstate 10 eastbound near Gutierre, Mississippi, blissfully unaware of the impending catastrophe. Simultaneously, a massive 18-wheeler journeying westbound on the highway experienced an inexplicable mishap one of its rare dual tyres dislodged. The consequences of this seemingly routine event spiralled into tragedy, where the colossal pair of tyres, each weighing approximately 500 pounds and securely bolted together, became airborne projectiles. They traversed the median strip and eastbound lanes with a forceful trajectory that led them to the unsuspecting rest area of the parking lot. It was here that Meg, in the midst of a leisurely walk back to her car with friends, fell victim to this bizarre turn of events. The tyres travelling an astonishing 850 feet collided with Meg, causing immediate and irreparable harm. Despite the prompt arrival of emergency responders, Margaret Moura was pronounced dead at the scene, leaving a void in the lives of those who knew her. The sudden loss reverberates as a collective heartbreak 
underscoring the unforeseen and arbitrary nature of such incidents. In a tragic tale that unfolded over the course of nearly a decade, the life of Sam Ballard, a once vibrant 19 year old from Sydney, Australia, took an unforeseeable turn during a birthday party there in 2010. What started as a seemingly harmless act, eating a slug as part of a dare turned into a life altering catastrophe for Sam. Little did he know that the slug harbored the insidious rat lungworm setting in motion a chain of events that would profoundly impact his life and those around him. Sam, an avid rugby player with a zest for life, soon found himself grappling with the dire consequences of his impulsive decision. The slug he ingested was infected with a rat lungworm, a parasitic nematode commonly found in rodents. This parasite, typically benign in its natural host, passed its larvae into the animal's feces. However, in an unexpected twist, the consequences of Sam's seemingly harmless dare were far-reaching and devastating. The rat lungworm infection triggered a rare and severe strand of meningitis. Sam's body, unprepared for the assault of this formidable illness, succumbed to the infection plunging him into a coma that would last a staggering 420 days. While most individuals might recover from meningitis, Sam faced an exceptionally challenging battle as the infection had taken a toll on his brain. Emerging from his coma, Sam confronted a harsh reality. He was now a paraplegic, paralyzed from the waist down. The once active rugby player was confined to a wheelchair, navigating a world that had dramatically transformed for him. Over the years, Sam valiantly faced a series of medical complications resulting from his condition. Each day brought new challenges and hurdles as he and his loved ones grappled with the ongoing repercussions of that ill-fated day. Despite the unwavering support of his family and friends, Sam's health continued to decline and on a quiet Friday at the age of 28, he succumbed to the enduring complication that stemmed from the lung-induced infection. In the peaceful village of Liberty, nestled amidst the rolling hills of Sullivan County, New York, a quiet Sunday morning was about to take an unexpected turn. It was a day like any other, the world seemingly unchanged, but little did the Peckney family know that their lives were about to be forever altered. In the heart of this tight-knit community, Christopher Peckney, a 28-year-old father-to-be, and his younger brother, Michael Peckney, 27, had embarked on a creative endeavour that was meant to bring joy and excitement to their lives. The Peckney family was eagerly anticipating a gender reveal party, a momentous occasion where they would unveil the long-awaited secret of their impending edition. As the clock neared noon, the brothers were diligently working on a special prop that would be the centerpiece of their gender reveal celebration. It was an explosive prop designed to ignite the day with a burst of colour and excitement, a symbol of the love and anticipation they felt for their unborn child. The prop was meant to be a prototype, a practice run to ensure everything would go smoothly when the actual gender reveal took place. Unbeknownst to them, this innocent endeavour would soon lead to an unforgettable tragedy. With the sun shining brightly overhead, the Peckney brothers carefully assembled the prop, unaware of the fate that lurked in the background. Their excitement filled the air as they envisioned the smiles, chairs and tears of joy that would accompany their gender reveal party. Then, in the unforeseeable twist of fate, disaster struck. The prop, which had been designed to solely bring happiness, suddenly detonated with a deafening explosion. Christopher Peckney, their expectant father, filled with dreams and hope, was taken from this world in an instant. His brother Michael was left injured and bewildered by the devastating turn of events. State police rushed to the scene, their hearts heavy with the weight of the tragedy that unfolded. Trooper Stephen Neville, who arrived to investigate the accident, could not fathom the irony of the situation. The prop, intended to carry a message of love and joy, had instead brought grief. 
It wasn't meant to harm anyone, Neville would later explain to NBC News, his voice tinged with sadness. It was just an innocent prop for a gender reveal that went horribly wrong. As the hours passed, the bomb squad initiated their investigation. Questions swirled about the materials Christopher Peckney had intended to use, a haunting reminder of the unanswered inquiries surrounding this heart-wrenching incident. In the small town of Shropshire lived a man named Alex Mitchell. He was an ordinary man in many ways, leading a simple life with a loving wife, Nessie, by his side. But as fate would have it, Alex was destined for an extraordinary end. It was a quiet evening in the Mitchell household. Much like any other, Alex and Nessie were relaxing in their cosy living room, enjoying the warmth of a crackling fireplace. The television was their faithful companion, and that evening, it was turned onto a popular British comedy show known as The Goodies. As the episodes unfolded, the room echoed with laughter. The trio of comedians on screen, Tim Brooke Taylor, Graham Garden, and Bill Oddy, had a way of tickling the funny bone, and Alex was particularly susceptible to their humour. He laughed heartedly, tears streaming down his face, his infectious laughter filling the room. But as the minutes passed, something extraordinary happened. Alex's laughter, once a source of joy, began to take a darker turn. He couldn't stop. His laughter intensified, becoming almost maniacal. Nessie watched in shock and terror as her husband's uncontrollable laughter continued. She tried to calm him down, but it was as if he had been seized by some invisible force. The minutes turned into an eternity and Alex's laughter showed no signs of stopping. And then, in an instant, it all stopped. The room fell into an airy silence and Alex slumped in his chair, lifeless. Nessie, grief-stricken and bewildered, reached out for help. She sent a letter to the very comedians who had unwittingly triggered her husband's bizarre and fatal episode. Thanking them for bringing joy to Alex's final moments, it was a strange twist of fate that would soon make headlines across the country. 37 years passed and the Ecky Fum episode of The Goodies remained etched into the collective memory of those who had witnessed it. The mystery of Alex Mitchell's death continued to baffle doctors and experts who were left with more questions than answers. And then, one day a group of medical professionals uncovered a new lead. They began to piece together the puzzle, attempting to understand the enigma that had confounded them for so long. After a thorough investigation and research, they reached a startling conclusion. It turned out that Alex Mitchell's death was not a mere coincidence. The constant and prolonged laughter had triggered a fatal chain of events. In those final moments, his heart had laboured beyond its limits. The laughter-induced stress of a cardiovascular system had led to a sudden and catastrophic heart failure. The revelation of this discovery added yet another layer to the legacy of Alex Mitchell and his fateful encounter with the goodies. In the beautiful island of Hawaii, a fisherman named Randy Lanes embarked on a fateful journey. Randy, a 47-year-old boat captain from Kona, was intimately familiar with the flow of the sea, a master of his depths. One Friday morning, under the brilliant Hawaiian sun, Randy's keen eye spotted a young broadbill swordfish. Its sleek form slicing through the waters of the harbour. The shimmering fish held its gaze and in that moment he made a decision. He grasped his trusty spare gun, determined to bring this majestic creature aboard his vessel. With precision and skill, Randy took aim and let the spare fly, striking the swordfish. The battle was not yet over. In a sudden unexpected turn, the swordfish's powerful bill, about three feet long, found its mark. Randy felt an excruciating pain as the swordfish's bill impaled him in his upper chest. The startling turn of events left him grappling with the very creature he had sought to catch. With the swordfish's resistance relentless, Randy's fellow fishermen rushed to his aid. They pulled him out of the water, his chest wounded, his strength diminishing. 
CPR was administered, a desperate attempt to bring him back from the brink, but it was in vain. The young broadbill swordfish, weighing around 40 pounds and measuring 3 feet in length, had delivered a fatal blow.